Okay, so it's been uh, quite a long. We have not checked the uh, syllabus copy. Uh, let's quickly check what are the topics we have completed and what are the topics that are left. Okay, so this was one of the highlighted one and from Encore. Okay, so this is N NRC and this is Encore. Okay. Okay, so today I'm covering NAT and PAT. Uh, we have covered a lot of things from security topic. Okay, so I guess those are the highlighted ones. Uh, what about here? Okay, nothing over here. Fine. Okay, so we are more of less left with wireless and automation, and rest of the topic. Uh, will be covered by uh, most probably by this week okay like all this pan net flow the the normal generic topics the additional ones from enterprise point of view is wireless and automation and yes there are few vpns here ipsec vpn uh, the virtualization okay so this is from encore side and what about nrc Bidirectional BFT, okay. Okay, so we have covered these Telnet, SSH, COPP. Okay, we have covered these console and VTY, SSH, SSCP, TFTP. So this this I'll take once once more. Okay, the uh, the file transfer protocol like TFTP, SCP, and uh, uh, uh what else you have ftp you have okay yeah and we have covered this urpf Okay, quite good. So we are now almost left with like uh, might be 30 to 40% uh, of syllabus. Okay, fine. So let me just close that. All right, so what is the topic for the day? Okay, it's it's going to be NAT and PAT. Okay, it's nothing but network address translation. And port address translation. Okay, so I'm gonna cover why do we have this concept and uh, a simple lab over on this. Let's go towards the topic. Okay. NAT PAT okay so basically why do we use NAT and why do we use uh, this PAT feature okay so let's say I have a uh, I have an enterprise design with me where I have placed a router in my core 
this router is connected to a switch which is in acting as in distribution layer and then I have the access layer switches okay so let's say there are couple of users sitting over here and let's say this is cloud or ISP and you all know this is public in phasing whereas these are private this is a LAN segment and this is a WAN segment now let's say the user traffic which is which which wants to go to the internet side so basically his traffic will hit the access layer access layer will access layer will one second Yes, so it will it will uh, move towards the upstream switch, which is in the distribution layer. The distribution layer will route it uh, since we are running some IGP protocols, and the core will now forward it to the ISP. That's a normal forwarding of the traffic. Now, what is the issue with this kind of traffic? Is as you know, within the LAN segment, we are making you use of RFC 1918 IPs. That's nothing but the private ranges of IP address. What about our WAN site? They are public in nature, right? Who assigns us public IP is the INA entity, right? So how can my private IP go towards ISP? Let's take, take into consideration for some reason, for some routing, uh, my private IP is able to reach towards the cloud. Now the problem is these IPs are exposed to all these uh, uh, users who are in the public phasing, right? So there could be the genuine or the legitimate customers. There could be attackers. There could be people with DOS attacks, right? Now they can cause DOS attacks. Now you know what is DOS attack. They can initiate those uh, ping, uh, lot of pings, lot of uh, the management protocol attacks and they can bring these servers down. Okay, you know how, how, how these telnet or uh, the COPP, right? So that was what we learned in the previous week. So we don't want our private uh, uh, IPs getting exposed in the van so the best practice is the one of the best practice says that whenever you get the rfc 18 ips 1918 ips over on the core router make use of a technology called as nat or pat okay so now what this technology does is it's gonna hide this private IP. So let's say this was on 172.16.1.1. Uh, okay. So it the packets till here will be sourced as 172 series. As soon as you have the NAT rules, then a packet will not be considered or not be going as 172. It will now be taking up that public IP which you are using in the NAT configuration. So let's say you are making use of 50.0.0.1. Now the packet will look like coming from this person. It's it's gonna hide the real person and gonna take a public IP towards ISP. Now someone who is trying to give a DOS attack will not be successful. The reason is this IP is just within this. So whenever the written traffic comes, the written traffic will come to 50.0.01 and because we have the NAT technology, it will get uh, untranslated. The packet will now once again be back to its real form and then it comes back to the user. So someone who is trying to cause DOS or DDoS or kind of management attack, he will be getting failed. Okay, That's one reason why we use of uh, make use of NAT 
to from the security point of view we just try to hide our private ips and we just want to uh, use a public ip which is given by isp okay so this was one of the reason the second reason i could say uh the second reason would be from ipv4 shortage point of view right so if you know what is the world population right now it's close to 7.8 billion and uh, what would be the total ipv4 address available it's like close to uh, 4.3 billion but surprisingly we are still working on ipv4 even even though the world population is like way greater than the ipv4 address and if you just assume one one person at least having at least two devices because some of them have even 10 devices so even if one one person ha got two uh, devices with him it might be a laptop and a mobile so you you can just see you can just see what what would be the final count of this close to 15 billion and on a ipv4 side you have only 4.3 billion left but still you will see a lot of ips that we receive on our laptop mobile are still ipv4 e even though even though we have something called ipv6 but we have not completely uh, got transitioned to ipv6 we are still using ipv4 and we are able to get the ips in the ipv4 range right so i would say uh, one of the one of the thing was that there's something called as pat as well as port address translation so this feature of nat is helping us to uh, to save ipv4 address okay and so that lot of guys can make use of uh, ipv4 address and how it works is uh, so let's say if I have 10 users or might be 100 users all using the private IPs, okay, something like this. Let's say there is one router which is directly pointing to ISP, right? So in case of PAT, what happens is, let's say I configured PAT here. All these are on their private IPs, let's say 16 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. 1 so when the traffic hits the router PAT, what PAT does is it's going to make use of one single public IP and it's going to add a port number. And you know what is the port number range. It can be 0 to 65535, right? This is the port range. So let's say random port number gets added up to the first traffic. Now let's say the traffic is coming from the second person who is on 1.2. Now the traffic will once again consider the public IP. And now the different port number is gonna get added up. Okay. Now let's say the traffic is coming from the last person 1.3. Now what happens is he is gonna get another port number getting added up so in this way even though we had like 100 of internal user the all 100 users were just using one single public ip so which is what is trying to give you an answer for this calculation that why 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 how can we still make use of ipv4 even though we have the whole population way greater than the ipv4 address right that's because these IPs, the single IP will get associated with multiple port number. That's that's the concept of PAT. Okay. And the traffic will go towards cloud. And when the written traffic comes, the written traffic will come exactly to that particular entry or the binding. So let's say if someone asks you uh, in the case of PAT, when the traffic is moving out towards the cloud, how about the written traffic? How How is the PAT router going to know that the traffic is for the first person or the second or third that's because these routers are gonna uh, they're gonna have something called as nat trans translation tables okay and these tables will have all the bindings mentioned it's something like your mac address table arp address 
table or routing table, right? They, those are something, the records or the entries of every uh, binding. Similar way, the NAT address translation table is going to bind all the records. So you will have your source, port number, destination, port number. And this is how when the return traffic comes back, the table is going to get looked up once again. The traffic is for 3200-01 port number. Now, what is the corresponding private IP for that? Let's say the corresponding IP was 1.1. .1, so the traffic will be sent to the first user. If the traffic hits the second port number, 32002, now the tr translation table will be checked and the traffic will be sent to the rightful person. So this is how <coughs> the lookup happens. Okay, This is how the NAT lookups happen. So there is a dedicated table for NAT which will keep records of uh, all the natting, patting and all other uh, required uh, things in the, the in, in this technology. Okay. So let me write some uh, keywords or let me write some uh, benefit of NAT and PAT as well. Okay, so as you know, NAT is network address translation and the other one is port address translation. Okay, so what, what, what kind of devices does NAT and PAT is being uh, used uh, to achieve? So basically your routers, your firewalls, Okay, so these are device which is uh, used to achieve NAT or PAT. Okay. Uh, how does it help? It helps in reduction of public IP usage. Okay. It's going to maintain its own NAT translation table. Okay. And what is the basic functionality of NAT? The private IP is going to get binded to a public IP. Okay. And then it goes to the cloud, something like this. And how is the return traffic from cloud? The uh, entry will hit once again to the public IP and the public IP will get untranslated. Now this is called as untranslated. Okay. This process is called untranslated. And about one was called as translated. Okay, what else? What else? Uh, yes, security concerns. Uh, you are you are hiding your RFC one nine one eight IPs, which is nothing but your private uh, classes of IPs getting exposed. Okay, and in case of NAT, uh, from the packet level. It's your layer three headers uh, or the layer three header, which change while sending out of the NAT uh, uh, router. Okay, so let me say exactly over here. So let's say the private IP was 172 series. Okay, so so internally a user in 172 when he initiated. Uh, a traffic towards cloud so his first traffic hits to the core router and in the core router you have your NAT process right now what happens is let's say this was the source IP and this was the destination IP so what happens is as soon as the source hits the NAT router NAT router is now gonna change the source head address to whatever public IP you have configured something like this Another traffic will go with source being 50.1.1 .1 and destination being whatever you are, you are you have initiated the ping. Similar way, when the return traffic is coming, let's say now source was 8.8.8.8. .8 now, what would be the destination? Destination is not going to be the private because private uh, because from a cloud point of view, private is unknown. The only cloud knows the traffic was being 
initiated by this person 50.1.1.1 now that traffic will hit public which is a router it's gonna do the untranslation and it's gonna uh, send to this person 172 series network okay so that's the address uh, change in the case of NAT And yes, what about uh, the PAT? PAT is used for a single public IP to different connection. Okay. And in the case of PAT, both layer 3 and the layer 4 headers are modified. Whereas in uh, NAT, it's only layer 3. Whereas in PAT, it's both layer 3 and layer 4. This was an uh, explanation about uh, the PAT, the uses, usage of PAT. Okay. What are the advantages uh, to mitigate the global public IP depletion, uh, private address space internally, okay, to, for, from the security point of view, and to hide the internal network topology. So regarding the header, as I was talking about that, normally what happens is in, in a normal scenario, Let's say uh, this is internal, internal user and this is someone in the internet, okay. So let's say you just initiated a ping command, ping 8.8.8.8. .8 now what is the source and destination? Source is gonna be, uh, the source is gonna be the uh, internal user. Let's say this is the 8.8. network, 8.8.8. network. Okay. Now this would be the header, the L3 header. And let's let's assume there is no NAT on your side. And the router is gonna do the same thing. It's it's gonna forward that same thing. 192, 168, 1.1, .1 and destination 1.3.4. Okay. And the return traffic will also be very transparent. It's gonna be now destination the user the internal ip and the source is gonna be the cloud now this is not a good approach okay we are exposing our private ips which which is not a good uh, point we have to secure them we have to make use uh, of a public ip so that we can hide our internal ips okay so let's say i introduced nat now and what happens in the nat in the nat even though it was originated from this person okay towards this guy so you you have your your source and destination okay but now the nat is been configured here and what is nat gonna do nat is gonna remove the source and it's gonna add its own outgoing interface as source now so you can see here the source is now 4.4.4.4 and destination is 1.3.4 now, from 1.3. point of view, in the case of return traffic, okay, 1.3.4 is not gonna know who is this person. He only knows the 1.2 uh, series guy. He only knows what is 4.4. because the traffic was initiated from 4.4.4. So the traffic will also be some somewhere very similar to that. You you are having the source from this person and destination being this person so the traffic will hit the nat router okay and since the nat router have the nat address table it's going to do the untranslation and the source will be uh, this person itself and now the destination he is going to remove that 4.4 .4 and he is going to put that 192 so this is case of nat Okay, so there are a uh, few things here in case of uh, NATing, especially it's called as terminologies. So let me show you this diagram. So let's say this is the LAN part. Okay, and this is the WAN part internet part uh, or let me say internet okay so whenever whenever we are uh, troubleshooting NAT there are some words that we use to uh, to to explain the things okay so basically how it works is or how basically the NAT address table would look like is 
so let's say if i have if i run the command show ip nat translation okay now this command will give us the entire bindings of the nat and they will look little different the little different in the sense they will the columns will be divided into four verticals okay something like inside local you will have something called as inside global you will have outside global and outside inside so don't do not worry when you see the nat table for the first time it's it's easy if you understand what is that okay so who is nat local nat local is your source it's that private user right so in this case this is the private right so i am going to say it's 192.168.51.5 who is called as inside local to me okay now when inside local is trying to ping this person what is nat router let's say this is the nat router what is nat router going to add it's going to add its own address acting as a source now it's it's going to take this because from the security point of view now what is inside global would be it would be this ip it would be 19851102 this is your inside global inside local is this the real ip we call this as real ip and we call this as a mapped ip okay now who are the outside global and out, uh, outside local we really do not care because i initiated a ping to this server which is 203.0113.11 right so for me the outside is someone whom i initiated the ping i don't know how is the nat happening on their side on the destination side so i am going to say this is going to be same for both the columns okay something like this this is my destination so this is how the table would look like inside local inside global outside global and outside in now if you want to understand where are these terms used then you must follow this diagram so inside local is one over here inside global is this particular nat public ip which is acting as now source okay and then you have your outside global let's say from the destination side whoever is uh, using this might be if we have a nat router which we really don't care okay so that will be outside global for him and outside local why i'm telling this is because it might be asked in your certification like uh, they might give you this scenario and they might ask like uh, what is inside local in this uh, or what is the inside global ip here so you must know these terminologies okay okay so let me quickly uh, read whatever it's written here so inside local okay it's nothing but it's a ip address assigned on the host so this could be uh, the ip address that you got it from the dhcp or might be the static uh, way of config configuring okay now what is inside global inside global is that legitimate ip address which is assigned by service provider as i said who who gives us the public ip it's the isp right so basically you will be expecting a public ip over here on this interface or more inside local ip address to the outside world so it's it's part of your lan it's part of your lan but phasing towards outside right so that that interface we call it as inside global address outside local address the ip address of an outside host okay so i call this whole thing as outside host because i do not know not necessarily a legitimate address it is allocated from a address space route table okay you will see the same definition for both of them that is your outside local and outside global because as i said we really don't care who is controlling on a destination side so that's up to them for 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 uh, for them it would be the same let's say if you guys are the network engineers over here so you know that this should be your inside local 
this portion would be your inside global and you will really not be concerned what is happening on this side right so for you guys this would be the outside local and outside global so you you you're not bothered how how the network engineers are controlling uh, these part of the networks fine now regarding the types of nat uh, it's once again uh, the easier topic because we have covered all this in um, ccna and might be in even even in your uh, enterprise you might have already worked so let me say the different types of nat and when do we use them so there are three types it's called as static nat we have dynamic nat and we have a uh, pat okay this pat is also one form of dynamic nat right so i can say there is one static and there is a two dynamic in nature okay now how do static look like so as the name suggest it it should be one to one addressing that means if you have a user okay and the user is uh, just sending it a uh, packet towards the router the the nat router okay and the nat router is forwarding it to cloud now i would say that let's say this is uh, a private ip okay and you have your inside global which is public ip uh, consider any any uh, public ip let's say this one and on the other side you have your global uh, outside global and outside local which is some public ip right so in the case of static is nothing but it's one to one binding you're directly binding your private with your own public nat ip okay this is called one to one so in this case it would be hard binded rule something like this okay now let's say you have one more user user number 2 and his ip is this now what happens in static is you cannot make use of the same ip now you must give another public ip and same thing same thing goes goes on so let's say you have 192.168.1.100 1 the public ip will also gradually increase right now practically this is not advisable static is not adver advertisable right because in this way there there could be like 100 different users and you might need 100 different public ips because of the one to one binding and you know uh, use uh, the the isp never provides you public ip in that that numbers right they they, they might give you like 10 ips or 20 ips or 30 ips they they each ips are cost uh, they are costing to your organization so you cannot make use of these public ip uh, just for one to one uh, uh, binding so you need to be more more uh, taking precaution about the static because in static it's like if you have 100 private you need to have 100 public to uh, give them one to one static binding right because these are done via cli you are going to define that this user is going to take this now let's say uh let's let's say then why do we really need static nat if 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 this is the drawback of having uh this approach then why do we need static so static is used especially when the traffic is coming from outside to in okay so let's say the traffic was initiated by the outside person the outside could be your customer a or might be it's a customer b let's say customer a is in mexico might be customer b is somewhere in australia right so do you think they will know the private ip they they do not know what is the private ip right so we would give them a public ip we would have given them that you have so and so to access the server so let's say this is a server okay and he can just 
hit on this public IP and the NAT router will untranslate and will send accordingly because after all the NAT translator will have all the records of the binding. He knows the NAT table will know the traffic is for this 50.1.1 and internally this has been uh, getting untranslated to so and so right so public ip in the case of static one to one is specially used for outside to inside traffic okay but let's say on other on other hand let's say for our internal users so let, let's say i have users with uh, like 10 different computers and the primary uh, need is just browsing okay they just need to browse that's all now, in this case, the traffic was originated from inside towards outside. And for this scenarios, you don't need static NAT. And if you use static NAT, then you know what is the drawback of that. If you have 50 users, you need to have 50 public IPs for, for this uh, type of communication. So, for inside to outside, when, when it's just about browsing, you don't go with static NAT. Okay, what is the approach now? Your approach can be the rest of the two. You can have dynamic NAT. Okay, so the dynamic NAT is a pool of public IPs. So let's say I have 10 public IPs given by the ISP 50.1.1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1 1.4. Okay, let's say 4 to 5 IPs. Now let's say this user, if he wants to go out, he will hit this pool, he'll take one of the IP and go out. Now let's say the second user, the second user will come back, uh, the second user will get initiated, he will, he might take the first one or he might take the second one depending upon the usage and he will go out. So this is how with, with like very less in number, like in 10, 10 in one pool, you can at least serve like uh, 100 to 200 users, okay. So you can have like concurrent connections, like you can have uh, a few connections and you can take each one of the uh, IPs and you can go out. There, there is no uh, strict uh, bindings. Okay, If you bind them, then you cannot use 1.2 with 1.1. That, that will not happen as in static NAT. Okay? Whereas in dynamic NAT, you have couple of IPs kept in a pool. Whenever the connection is going, it will take one of the IP and it will get reset. The IP is free once again for the next connection to handle. Okay, so dynamic NAT is when it's inside to outside. The traffic is inside to outside, and similar way static is when you, when you have the outside traffic coming in because they don't have your in uh, phasing server IP, the public IP. They they just know is that there is some public IP given to them, and now it's your uh, duty or it's your configuration that's gonna bind this to a private IP okay so in such scenario we use static dynamic so when do we use PAT PAT is when you have dynamic in features that means your source that means these people who are in slash 24 okay now they are hitting the PAT router or the NAT router and IPs are in uh, like say 26 subnet okay you have 24 and you have let's say 28 subnet okay they are they are they are they are in dynamic in nature because you are not hard binding them it's it's dynamic but what pad does is the pad other than the dynamic uh, NAT what it does is it's gonna make use of the port numbers here port numbers don't get used in the in the case of dynamic net there is no port number concept but in the case of pat the port numbers get started reflecting okay so you will see one of the server like 192 168 1.1 is considering the port number so and so okay it's gonna hit 50.1.1.1 on 3001 port number Similar way, you have 192, 1.2 .2, and it's taking some other port number. Okay, they are randomly originating and it, it will hit the same IP 50.1.1.1 .1, but the connection will be built on a different port number. So, that's the difference between dynamic and pad. So, I'll do the lab 
and you will understand how how exactly they are different okay so these are the three main types and as you know static is when it's for outside to inside traffic okay uh, dynamic nat and pat is when inside to outside okay So you have some examples here, which you can refer. Okay, let me quickly do uh, one of the lab and I'm also giving you some practice set, which you can practice. Okay, that would be this one under assignments. So I've given you one simple lab. You have to, conf uh, you have to uh, do this. If uh, let's say, I, I guess you have these instances with you, right, already. So if you have these instances, it's just the routers and uh, the switches. Okay, there's nothing, nothing else here. There's one uh, adapter, one router, one switch, and uh, three PCs. You can use any platform. Uh, if you want GNS, you can use GNS, or if you want packet tracer, you can do packet tracer. In case you do not know how to bring these devices, and if you don't want to waste your time, so you can use packet tracer and practice okay so this assignment will help you in building a small design writing an ip address okay configuring them so i've also given you all the configuration with the uh, validation so if in case you are stuck somewhere okay so let's do the lab uh, for the day and the rest you can take it forward so in this this particular lab i'm focusing on this part okay this uh, let me highlight so this is what we going to consider okay very simple lab what what is my normal scenario is i have two computers on two different ips but on the same subnet so let's say this is on 172 168 40.100 and this is on 172.168.40.101. Okay, two different IPs. I have layer two switch. They are basically not doing anything other than uh, switching the package to the upstream device. Okay, so when I initiated ping, you will expect it coming to a switch, which will send to the router. Same thing when it comes to this switch, it will send to this, and this will send to the upstream. So basically, there is nothing happening here, just the normal. Uh, uh, thing uh, uh, nothing else okay and over here if you remember this particular se uh, section was used in hsrp and vrrp so over here i had used something called as sub interfaces so from my previous configuration i have something for uh, uh, 10 and i also have 0 0.40 you can take in either of them it's all good but i just considered 0 0.40 okay so on 0 0.40 i have this as my gateway now this is a gateway for these two users who are on 40.100 and 40.01 so basically you should be able to reach this gateway they are on a they are on the same network then you should be able to reach this okay and yes, in between, uh, you can, of course, take care of the layer 3 because, uh, sorry, uh, not layer 3, layer 2. So basically, this will be on VLAN 40. Uh, this is on VLAN 40. Okay. This will be configured now as a trunk. Okay. With L VLAN allow 40. And this is again on trunk VLAN 40. Whereas this is, as I said, they are on the sub interface which will be having encapsulation of 40 okay the normal inter vlan concept that we did long back okay inter vlan so the basic thing the first step would be just to ping from that to the gateway 40.1 once i am successful with that what i have done is on the upstream direction i have kept dhcp where am I expecting the DHCP coming from? From this NAT adapter. Okay. NAT adapter is running on 192, 168, 32 series for me in my case. Okay. So I am getting an automated IP from my NAT cloud. And this NAT cloud will also is connecting me towards internet because that's how I am getting towards internet. So 
so i can i can i should be able to ping 8.8.8.8 okay so basically uh, after after doing a ping test is basically what i'm trying to say is this person can reach towards cloud okay just a normal lan segment so let's say this is a lan and this is a van right that's what i started the day with i said lan and van so if i have pinging this guy what ip should i see and what ip i sh should not see right so that was the whole concept of uh, nat and pat we studied so if when i ping and let's say i take the varsha capture here i should not see my private ip that is 172 now what will you do you will bring your nat configuration here when you bring nat configuration you have three ways you have static way you have dynamic way and you have pat uh, nat right or pad dynamic nat so we will do each one of them we will take we will extract the wireshark capture we will see how the packets are modified the source header the, the as i said the l3 header gets modified l2 l2 will not be a big concern so we will see how the l3 header is getting changed at this uh, this this uh, point okay so let me clear all the markers so if you see here a simple thing first normal behavior is pinging to this okay and you know what are the configuration if if you're stuck with that then I'll, I'll i'll provide you that as well okay so i have already uh, given the configurations so on the pc9 that's the computer okay so on the pc9 you have these ips configured on the routers the, the this router you have your sub interface configured and on the upstream which is connecting to cloud you have your dhcp okay so normal thing let's once again open them and check how, how are they configured so i have my private ip which is 172.16.40.1 okay so it's 40.1 okay and on the second device it's 40.2 two host on same network okay let's see from the uh, the switch side as i said there will be some access vlan and uh, a trunking on the upstream so let's see gi0 slash 2 okay so there is a access vlan with vlan 40 uh, what about 0 slash 0 that's on trunk why, why why i have done trunk is because that is inter switch connection right so this will be on access port uh, in between inter switch we make use of trunking because we had uh, two or three vlans might be we have to send it across the two switches so on the first switch that is moscow switch one on gi0/0 i have trunk and let's see from 0 slash 1 once again it's trunk and where is this trunk connecting now this is trunk connecting straight towards the router okay if you want me to show you this i can show you that as well so one side uh, as as you expect once one side which is towards host it will be access port access port on vlan 40 and the inter switch will be vlan where i'm allowing the two vlans okay and nothing nothing else so the vlans are reaching towards the router now let's see from the router side as i said this was an example for hsrp so in the case of hsrp i did two gateways to demonstrate uh, the hsrp functionality so if i open up my show ip interface brief exclude unassigned you will see there is something called as 1.1 and there is something called as 1.40 over on 0 slash 1 interface that is this interface okay so there, there are two sub interfaces on 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 this particular uh, interface okay how do i configure so if you go first to the physical ip you have to make no shutdown because the physical interface has to be 
uh, up okay it it shouldn't be uh, in admin administrative state so it should be no shut once you do that go to your sub interfaces okay it's uh, ethernet okay and over ethernet you can uh, you know the, there is an encapsulation because on the other side on the downstream you have a switch in trunking so you configured your encapsulation you have your ip address okay and forget this for now i'll tell you what it is so you just configured your gateway now let's give a ping test from the computers the two computers if if the computers can directly reach to their own gateway okay something like this so from both side i am going to give the ping test Sorry, I guess I lost you guys. Uh, okay. Uh, so let me just uh, rewind and just let me cover what was I telling. So as I said, there is a gateway here on uh, one dot forty sub sub interface. So first thing I'll just verify is that if I can ping my own gateway. Okay. So what is my IP on this computer? Let's see if config ether zero. So this is my IP 40.0. And what is the gateway? It's on 40.1. Okay. And yes, I'm able to reach. Now let's see from the second computer. That's if config ethernet zero. So it's the second computer. Let's see whether it can reach its own gateway or not. And yes, it can reach its own gateway. And what did I do on the cloud side? So I said I am doing a DHCP here. So let me show you that. I did a DHCP. Okay. Once again, ignore this command. This command is for the NAT. Okay. The normal basic configuration is this, which is what I have mentioned in my uh, workbook. Okay. So you will see the DHCP command without NAT. So exclude NAT, which is not relevant as of now. And totally what is happening is I can ping straight away to this. Okay. I have put one static route, which will help me to reach to the cloud and to get the return traffic. Something like this. Basically, uh, what I have seen is this, this was not been injected by, by me automatically that was being triggered because I was using a cloud and automatically I saw in the routing table, I got something like this. Okay. But let's say in your case, you don't have a proper NAT cloud and still you want to reproduce the same lab in, in your, in your case then you will end up with giving some router here. Okay. So only intention is that your traffic is to come here and you have to get the written response so that you can test your NAT, right? So in that case, you have to manually give the IP because, uh, because, because that would be the manual work. That's why I, I have mentioned the manual uh, static route, which is important for from the written packet point of view. Otherwise, written traffic will not come back to me in this topology okay a a any topology you either you have to configure ospf okay or, uh, or or any static route so basically what happens is your traffic will reach here okay since it's having a database where where it knows what is connected on the other side it, it will reach here but what about the written traffic this this person doesn't know who is this right so he's not gonna send it he's gonna drop them right so that's why i have set a written traffic uh, static gateway so that anything is coming to me go back to this and since this router is having the routing table it will come back to me it's just a, a solution to fix this okay it's just a normal uh, routing so what i'm i'm going to do is i'm going to test 
public IP now because I have configured static route. Okay, if I do my show IP route, I know my internal routes and this is towards outside. Okay, so let's try to ping 8.8.8, .8 which is a public facing. Let's say that's a Vodafone IP. Okay, and I can see it's reachable. Let's see from the second computer. And both the computers are reachable to cloud, right? So this is my simple basic achievement so far. Now let's see, let's take some captures here. If I take some captures, okay. If I go with the ICMP, first let's verify I don't have any NAT rules. If I do, then I'll take them out. So let's take this so that I can do it step by step. Okay, so I don't have any other NAT rules. Fine. Okay, and what about reachability? I can reach to the Vodafone cloud. Okay, but what is my Wireshark talking about? So if you see, these are the recent traffic, right? And you see, I'm... I, I, anyone anyone who is in the cloud they can see where the traffic is coming from they are coming from the internal users right the rfc ips rfc 1918 1, private ips which is not good which is not good and this is the whole reason we will see how to deploy pat and nat in this lab and how how are we gonna hide our private ips i don't want anything 172, uh, 40.10 or 40.20 reaching towards cloud. This, this, where, where, where am I capturing this Wireshark output? I'm taking it on my cloud facing here. This is the WAN side. So on my WAN side, there could be many other hackers, intru intruders, uh, anyone, right? So they, they can see my IP, where, where the original source is coming from. So I'm gonna apply NAT rules here. So as I said, there are three types. One is uh, static, uh, dynamic and uh, the third one was uh, the dynamic NAT uh, or PAT which we call. So let's do the first one. Let me demonstrate the first one which is one to one NATing. Okay. So I'll go to my router. Okay. I'll go to configuration T. And it's very simple thing. It's one to one binding. So I say IP NAT. If you do a question mark, so there are a couple of things uh, you want uh, a dynamic or static. So basically, this is a static uh, as of now, right? So I'm going to say source address translation. So I'm going to say source. W what kind of thing I need? I need a static. Okay. And what is the binding so let's say for this user who is on 40.10 okay and as, as i said it's a static so i have to define uh the the outgoing public ip so let's consider some public ip which i have got it from my isp something like this okay so once i do this statement the next thing that i need to do is i have to define who is my NAT inside interface and who is my NAT outside interface? That's important. Okay. I must say that this is going to be my NAT inside and uh, this outside interface is going to be the NAT outside. So these two commands will help in terms of directions. Okay. So how, how should I do that? I'll go to interface E0, E0. 1.40 because uh, that's the interface where the gateway is configured. I'm going to say IP NAT uh, inside. Okay, it's just a single command. I'll go to the second uh, or the uh, upstream interface, which is E0 slash 2. And I'm going to say IP NAT outside. Okay, but before that, let me see the NAT translation table. And there is nothing so far because there is one command which is pending, which is IP NAT outside. Okay. Let's see from the Wireshark. Okay. So Wireshark will trigger or 
will take the change when I stop this and redo. Okay. Otherwise, the NAT will not be reflected. So let me once again do. So it says 40.10. So what is the binding that I have enabled for show IP NAT translation? Okay, so it is not taken up. So let me see the NAT rules once. What about the interface? Are they on a right interface? Okay, and what about two? So let me once again reinitiate ping. Am I on right router? It's R19. Okay. So let me close the other things. So this is R19. Okay. I guess this some other com there is some other configuration which might be overriding this. Okay. So it's 172 16 40 dot 10 binded up with 50.1.1.1. Okay, so yes, there is something which is messed up. Okay, so let, let me do that. Let me correct that. Okay, so when I say IP NAT, what am I NATing to that uh, line? I have not mentioned that. If you, if you see this line, this line is only talking about source static NATing, but I have not mentioned a, a keyword which it says. Uh, with what I am trying to NAT because I have to say IP NAT inside source static. That's how this line should be. Okay, so I'll take out take out that line. So there's one keyword that got missed. Also, let's keep this. Uh, Okay, now let me put that command. It says IP NAT. <laughs> what is what NATing? It's it's your inside address translation that you want to bind with source being static to which, which is your inside network. It's your 172.160.16.40.10 uh, and what are you binding it with? You're binding it with 50.1.1. Okay. So this was one keyword that got missed. Now let's initiate this. So let's go to PC9 and let's initiate. I have, okay. So you can see now there's a change in the NAT address now. So, so pre prior to this on a normal scenario, you were able to see some private ranges 40.1. But now you do not see that you see something coming from 50.1.1 and as you know this is a packet analyzing happening on a cloud side so for a cloud users or a cloud person it could be anyone they really do not know who is behind this 50.1.1.1 okay and they cannot cause any kind of management attacks or ping attacks or any kind of the telnet ssh attack okay so how how is router gonna know what what is this getting untranslated to so i'll go to the router i'll make use of the show ip nat translation command and over here as i said they are gonna keep their own tables okay so it says inside global i told you there are four verticals something like inside local which is your host where, where, where you might have got it from static ip or the dhcp ip you have your inside global, which is your own LAN public IP, which is from given by the ISP. Okay. And on the outside, you, you don't care how, how the outside is being uh, arranged. Uh, what is the NAT on the destination side? So they are always going to be the same IPs on the outside side. Okay. So this is how it will create its tables. Okay. 
so you can see the ips are getting binded up now the problem with this static is you have to bind one to one mapping so for example the second user let me configure for the second user so i go back once again to the same rule and now it's 20 okay and and what what is it gonna trigger the alert uh, alert it's gonna say it there is already a similar static entry for 10 to this so basically you cannot have two private ip binded with single public in the case of static so i have no other option than making use of second public ip so the more users i have in my private the more public ips get so basically it's one to one so we don't prefer this for inside to outside for normal browsing it's more when we are expecting the customers initiating the traffic okay so if i do the nat so this is my existing rule so what i do is i'll say i have 40.20 but now the traffic the public ip would be on the second public ip and we can initiate the traffic from the second computer so we have the traffic okay we have the second public ip getting utilized so this is the icmp packet okay and if you see the uh, layer 3 header so from the anyone who is trying to decode he will only see that source is getting originated by this person now he will not know who is the real guy behind 50.1.2 okay and how would be the translation table look like so you have okay this is because there is no current connections okay so what i do i'll initiate for both and i'll redo this command so you get something like this okay so you have your uh, 50.1.1.2 bind it to this okay so this is for last two connections one to one connection and similar way you have your 50.1.1 binded with 40.1 so you you take it in this way that on on this user if he is making use of 10 applications okay all the 10 applications will make use of uh, one single ip it's like one to one and they are going to keep their own uh, identification with the help of the port numbers okay but this is a static in nature so one user one public ip now this is not feasible in the production so what i'll do is i'll take out these two rules and i'll show you how how is the second type applied okay so i'll take this it says that it's in use do you want to delete it yes i'll take the second nat rule yes okay let me once again see the running configuration so everything is clear now regarding to the dynamic nat as i said it's it's pool to pool that means on your source side you have your private pool and on your destination side you have another 10 to 20 uh, public ips in a in a pool configuration okay so the best way to configure dynamic is have your access list getting integrated with the NAT pool. That way, you can give your access list as your uh, source and the NAT pool as your destination. Uh, so let me let me write it over here. The configuration uh, for the dynamic NAT. Okay. So as I said, the source internal users. It's better we make use of some access list. Okay. And for destination, uh, or, or or let let me see, let me talk from the, the the actual terminology from the Cisco point of view. The inside local, we will make use of access list. Inside global, we will make use of uh, uh, the NAT pool. Okay, and final line, final NAT line, would be nothing but where I would say that sources so and so access list and destination is so and so nat pool and whatever i want to achieve okay
So we can do that. So how would the configuration look like? So let's say I configure first the inside local. So I, I'll say access uh, list, okay? You can use any uh, uh, number, okay? You can make use of either 10 or, or, or anything. Let's go with a standard ACL, okay? So let's say I go with 50. What do you want to do with this uh, access list? You're gonna permit some of the users, right? And what users, so let's say 172, uh, 16, 40.0 is your network okay where, where, where you have two users for testing purpose what is the wildcard mask it's a class uh, c let's take it as slash 24 so this act as my source what about now destination which is now a pool okay where i say ip nat pool let's give a word so let's take as network uh, journey okay and uh, what is, is what is it gonna ask what, what is it for it's for your inside global right inside global is nothing but which consists of some ip ranges like 10 ips so so if you do question mark here you will get lot of options where one is range where you can give like uh, starting from so and so ip to so and so uh, ip range the second is subnet mask Okay, but let's consider a fact it's a public IP and I don't get something like slash 24. So let's go with a range. So let's say it's 50.1.1 to 50.1.10. Let's say ISP give me 10 IPs. Okay, and what is the network mask for this? Or, or let's say what is the net mask for this? So let's give it as 255, 255 and uh, 248, some, some, some network mask. Okay. And the final line is about binding of source with destination. It's, it's very easy if we have this kind of approach now where I just have to say IP NAT inside source. What is your internal? If you remember in my previous case, I said internal was this and destination was this. But in this case, who is my inside? Inside is nothing but it's my access list, which is 50. Okay, and who is my destination? Destination is nothing but my pool, which is over here. Okay, three lines for dynamic NAT. Three three lines. Okay, one is nothing but your whatever you're permitting. Your permitting is nothing but your internal users. And what is your inside global? Inside global is nothing but this public IP range, which you received from the isp now let's copy the whole three lines and let's let's paste it here and do we have the running con running uh, ping yes so if you see as as soon as the ip nat was removed they were back with their normal behavior the internal headers right so let me place this dynamic nat okay so what does it say there's some issue i see uh mask too small should be at least 240 fine so let's go with subnet mask of 240 okay i'll just re okay there's a spelling mistake okay and i'll paste it on my console okay it says dynamic mapping is in use and ip nat fine so it has taken up let's see the translation okay so we have the active connection and uh, you see when you have your bunch of uh, ips they will make their decision okay so one user went with 1.1 and on some port number 20 took the second ip you had nothing to manually bind them the good thing is there is no manual binding now let's say if this user was down now let's say this user is down and he might be he's logging out and he's going out of the office now that ip or this public ip it it's free now okay so after some time this this is gonna be uh, getting released from this binding a uh, temporary binding so that's a benefit between a static nat and a dynamic nat in static it's hard coded 
if you once code even though that's not been uh, the user is logged out and might be uh, uh, you need to use reuse the uh, public ip you will not be able to do but in the case of a dynamic net you can use it once once the log uh, uh, user is down or let let me do clear clear this okay i can also clear the translation okay so i guess there is a asterisk symbol okay now if i make use of no, uh, show ip nat translation so things are free now so i only have one connection which is going on okay and and there is no nothing from the other person so you see there is nothing nothing coming from the other person so that's a good thing about dynamic nat but as you know they are still going to take one to one kind of connection which is not good from uh saving those ipv4 ips right because nothing nothing is going to be saved it's still one to one but it's little uh, advance in kind of saving uh, or making or making a reuse of the used public ip so what i'll do is i'll use the third option which is pat okay so i'll take this as pat now so the pat is again very similar to the second type dynamic nat you only need to do is you need to give one additional keyword called as overload okay so to do this i have to first stop my active connection because it will not let me to uh, add this it is going to say that it's currently used and all all those things so i have to take them out so i'll take this single line because the rest are same same okay so i have to say yes let's make sure there is no table there is nothing let's bring this up once again okay something like this and now let's initiate from both the side so i have one user i have second user okay and i can see both of them getting used let's see from the translation table so now you see both users are making use of single ip single public ip how are they working on different port numbers what are these port number they are nothing but from the user generated port number so user is uh, generating a packet with some random port number that port number will be tagged with your inside global public ip so that is how when the return traffic comes from the cloud okay when the return traffic is going back okay when it's hitting on this particular port number this table will get looked up and this table know that this is binded up with so and so user it's it's binded up with this user right so that's how uh, the return traffic will know how 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 is the uh, look up going on okay so let me uh, take the snipping of these tools Uh, these these outputs okay so that i can show you so let's say this was in the case of pat okay similar way i'll show you for dynamic nat and might be i'll also show the static so let me go back and delete this reload back okay and if i do show ip nat translation so this is the binding okay so let's take the capture of this so this is dynamic nat so you see here in dynamic nat uh, you now started up with dot 2 dot 3 okay that's what happens in the dynamic nat it's simple to configure uh, that you don't have to do the static binding and uh, the second benefit is reusing them but it it's it it once again act as a uh, static only and what about the static now so
IP <coughs> NAT inside source static. Uh, what was IP one seventy two sixteen forty dot ten fifty dot one dot one, and then the second one was on second public IP. Okay, and I hope this running traffic. Let's take the captures. So this is in the case of static. So you see in the case of static it is always one to one binding which is wastage of lot of public ips and we know that we don't get so many public ips okay so in this case uh, the, the static is widely used when the traffic is originating from your customer end and it's coming towards your lan uh, server side so in that case you need to have your one to one binding with these servers so let's say you have server 1 server 2 server 3 then this router must know that this public ip is binded to this this is to this this is to this and this is to this okay that's when the outside to inside because initially there will be no translation table right once once the translation table is built up then you really don't need static you can also make use of pat or dynamic net but let's say that there was no ta table so you cannot you cannot take it granted that uh giving him this connection thinking there will be some connection every time but we never know there could be some time when the connection is not present and uh, might be he is using it from outside and, and since there is no table the the uh, the router is going to drop them okay so outside to inside in case of this in the case of dynamic net it's inside to outside and same thing with a uh, pat outside uh, sorry inside to outside okay so you see here in the case of nat it's easy for us to configure but once again they are going to look like the static only so you see the third one came into picture now right so in in this you had one or two here the one was just utilized so meanwhile the new connection took up the new ip from this so once again the shortage of ip whereas in the case of pat it's wisely making use of the public ip it's going to have like uh, more than like 500 connections on the single public ip and you will see lot of uh, users getting connected on on the same public ip okay so uh, this is all from the nat side and uh, uh, for you guys to practice i have given a simple uh, a simple topology with something looks like this okay so you you can do you can practice it uh, so basically you have to do the same thing which uh, was done today i have dhcp here you can take the nat cloud or you can take a, you can keep a router and you can just put some ip so that uh, you you can reproduce the or re recreate them okay you have the server you have your inside local and this act as inside global and outside global and outside local and you have some uh, public ips which is given by the isp and over here you have your uh, private ip rfc 1918 if you are stuck some point the configurations are already mentioned so you have your uh, basic configurations for r1 the nat static nat configuration the address translation tables okay similar way you also see the dynamic nat where you have to create some pools and finally the pat configuration where you can see how the bindings happen so let me show you some commands one is show ip nat translations okay show so ip nat you have statistics which is going to show you all different output from packet level okay so how many packets 
you received here how many got translated okay if you want you can also enable ip uh, debug ip packets which will also give you the source and destination in case of if if you want to see uh, see something like this in order to see the source and destination but this debug ip packets don't do in the production okay uh, you you can if if you have wireshark you can better use that but don't make use of debug packets because every packet will get uh, get recorded on your router and due to the uh, the usage of of the cpu on these boxes uh, there's chances that they start dropping or they might crash okay so don't use the debug commands all right guys so that was from my side if you guys have any doubt please let me know and uh, so are we all good All right, okay. All right, guys. So, so let's see. Let's meet up in the uh, next class and have a, a wonderful day and uh, see you soon, okay? So, thank you everyone for joining.